with Amazon Aurora or you haven't used it and that's cool because you know I wanted to be sure uh, who I'm speaking with so so I know exactly how to do this. Um, so first of all, thank you for having me uh, and us and of course the uh, the whole group. I am very honored to you know to be able to share this evening speaking about Aurora and uh, yeah and Javier, I'm a developer advocate at AWS. I'm based in Madrid, but I cover uh, usually the whole of, of uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And basically, as a developer advocate, what I do is I engage with technical audiences to tell you what's possible with cloud, which will be the best practices, and uh, very importantly also to understand how we are doing. Uh, I like to understand how you are using the services, if you are not using them, why you are not using the services, if, if we have to improve them, or those things that you don't like, uh, like things, I, I don't know. Uh, so I'm not using something because it's too expensive or it's too slow, or it doesn't have integration with whatever. That's super interesting because at AWS, about 90% of the features we implement are because customers are telling us what they are missing. And um, part of my job is actually understanding what you are missing. Do you have any feedback about the service? Uh, please get in touch. You have there my Twitter, SuperVoco9, and I'm always more than happy to you know have a conversation and understand better our customers. So, uh, and I specialize on data analytics and machine learning. And today I'm going to be speaking about databases. And I chose this title, Amazon Aurora, why is better than your relational database? Because I know it's provocative. And when I say that something is better, this is uh, IT. In IT, there is always a trade-off. So th there is nothing which is better, absolutely better than other thing on IT. So I don't want to offend anyone. It was just like a fun title, but uh, yeah, you know how it is. Yeah, you have to choose and you have to, in the end, you choose what is better for your business. So if you choose a different database at Amazon Aurora, that's the best for you and that's totally fine. So when I say here, you know, why it is better, it's just for setting expectations. But uh, of course, you know better than me your use case, and you know better than me what is better for you. But I believe Aurora, Amazon Aurora is a very good database, and I want to tell you today what I know about Aurora. So first thing first, uh, Aurora is a database which is designed by AWS, but is compatible both with MySQL and Postgres. So when you start Amazon Aurora, when you start working with Aurora, it will ask you if you want to use Aurora with process compatibility or Aurora with MySQL compatibility. And we offer a few versions, so you can choose the version you want to use. We are, we are slightly behind the official version always, but once there is a new version in open source MySQL or open source Postgres, shortly after, we offer the same version on Aurora. But that's kind of the idea. So it's compatible with MySQL, it's compatible with Postgres, and it's designed for the cloud. That's the first thing. Uh, we offer more databases on AWS, more relational databases. You can actually choose to, to use the uh, open source Postgres managed by AWS. You can also choose to use open source MySQL managed by AWS, and we have many customers choosing that. But I believe for many use cases, Aurora is a bit better. And why is that? Well. First thing is not only me telling you, uh, since we released Aurora, and Aurora is already a few years old, uh, it might be four or five years old at least. And since we released Aurora, uh, I've been a bit surprised to see it's the fastest growing service in the history of AWS. So the rate of adoption is actually quite big. We have a lot of customers uh, moving to Aurora. And, and of course, I, I knew it was a good service, but to me it was surprising, which is the, the one which is growing the fastest. And, and there are a few reasons for that. And the first one is because it's trying to redefine a little bit how databases work. If you've been around databases for a while, you know a traditional database, a relational database, your uh, MySQL or Postgres or Oracle or SQL Server or MariaDB or any relational database in general, they, they work this way. You have some storage, which is you know the hard drives which are attached to your computer. And then you have the CPU and the memory, of course. And the CPU has to do a lot of things. It has to take care of not only of executing the SQL commands, but also keeping track of the of print transactions, 
rolling back if there is an issue. Uh, whenever you are doing select statements, is caching those results usually on in memory so you can have better performance. Whenever there is an update to a record on the database, uh, it will usually have to uh, to invalidate the cache if you know if that record was cached. Uh, and it has to do a lot of login because traditional databases, they are super interesting because they allow you to have transactions, they allow you to do very cool things, but that's supported by login. So basically, every time there's transaction, uh, something is written to some binary log that we can then you know draw back if something is wrong. And all that happens on the CPU. So the CPU is doing a lot of things and, and it's doing a lot of work when you are working with a traditional database. And I'll tell you later how Aurora is changing that. Uh, one of the things with relational databases is that if you want to scale, it's typically a bit hard to scale a relational database. So if you want to scale, uh, there are a few options. One option is do sharding. And if you have been working with databases for a while, and if you have ever done sharding, you know sharding is something not really great because basically sharding a database means that you are going to have multiple instances for the database, and you are going to be storing a part of the data in one server, a part of the data on a different server, and that's super tricky when you have to do joins and relations and so on. Uh, another option is just having like totally separate databases, totally different uh, servers for different parts of the application. And another one, it will be basically uh, having two different database servers sharing the same list, the same storage. And in all those cases, you are still using the same monolithic pattern of the CPU is doing a lot of work. So the AWS team decided to do something about this. Because of course, you've seen that in the past few years, there are a lot of NoSQL databases. And the main reason for NoSQL databases, one of the reasons, is scalability. And the Amazon team wanted to do something that will enable to use a relational database because relational databases are great, but you could use them at a scale in a more cloud native way. So they decided to re redefine how databases work. And this is what we did. So when you create an instance of Amazon Aurora, every time you uh, store anything on the database, when you write any row, any record, it's going to be replicated six times on different hard drives. So you're going to hide to have six different uh, hard drives storing your changes. And they are going to be across three different availability zones. And if you are not familiar with that, because I know some of you might not be super familiar with AWS, I know some of you are very familiar, but some of you might be a bit new. An availability zone is the way we uh, design our data centers on AWS. So the way we work, when you choose to store your data in, let's say, for example, uh, Frankfurt or Paris or whatever you are choosing the region AWS, we have actually, we build data centers in at least three different cities in that region, in that country. So take for example, I'm from Spain and we are going to be opening a new region in Spain. So we are uh, building three different data centers in three different cities. Each of them is separated about 50 or 60 kilometers. And, uh, and each of those data centers, we call that an availability zone, which means they are connected directly with fiber optics. And uh, so they are connected by fiber and they have like very low latency between region, between zones. Latency tends to be one or two milliseconds. So basically, if you store your data across multiple availability zones, it is very close, so you know you can do applications that perform very quickly. But in case of a disaster, if there is any trouble in one of the data centers, because I don't know, imagine there is a flooding, or imagine there is some, uh, let's hope not, but an earthquake, or imagine there is a, har a major hardware failure or something like that. If one availability zone goes down and your database lives on that data center, then you are going to be, you know, you, do, you don't have access to the database. With Aurora, we replicate automatically the data across three different availability zones, which means every time you change anything on the database, it's going to be stored directly on three or on six different places 
So for each zone, we automatically replicate uh, on two different uh, hardware devices. So that means if there is any issue with your database, if there is some problem with the physical device, with the physical hard drive, or if there is any problem, any problem with the connectivity of that data center, whatever happens, you still have five, or if the whole zone is failing, you still have uh, four different copies of your data, and Aurora automatically is going to switch to a different ability zone to serve your uh, your data. So the first thing is like it's highly available. Without, without you having to do anything. These, um, these six copies of the data, they are totally transparent for you. You only write the data once, you only query the data as you will do, but behind the scenes, we are doing that automatically. So it gives you uh, very interesting things. And the other thing is that all these uh, storage, we are separating from the CPUs. It's not tied to the same instance. It's not a local hard drive. It's a, ser, uh, you know, it's a separate storage, a separate storage layer that is working here on the, uh, you know, on the database. And you may have noticed a difference. In the previous slide, I was showing you, sorry, in the previous slide, I was showing you the database takes care of SQL, transactions, caching, and login. In this particular case, we are moving login out of here because since we are replicating the data in an intelligent storage tier, the logging happens at this level. So we are offloading the CPU from some work. And it, this will have interesting side effects. But yes, you know, this is the first thing. It's very, without you having to do anything, you get better availability. You can also uh, scale your database in a very efficient way. An Aurora database can have up to 180, uh, 128, sorry, 128 uh, terabytes which is not too bad for a relational database. So 128 terabytes of data on a single instance, on a single database. And you can create up to 15 read replicas. So you will have always one write replica, only one, one database to write, but you can create 15 read replicas. So you can scale a lot. And since we are, uh, since all the replicas are using the same series storage that we are replicating automatically, Replication is very fast. Usually it's less than 10 milliseconds from the moment you write to the master, from the moment all the replicas are in sync with the master. So you can have a very efficient operation. You can scale quite a bit using uh, Aurora. And it's not only that we are storing the data in different physical devices. It's also that we are choosing to store the data in very small chunks. So uh, something we decided when we were designing the system was to define which was the maximum size of a segment of a page, if you want, of the database. And we choose to store all the data in chunks of 10 gigabytes. Why 10 gigabytes? Because if you have a 10 gigabits uh, link with the database, with the network, and you have blocks of about 10 gigabytes, Restoring a block, it takes only 10 seconds. Why is this important? Because in the case of a disaster, if there is any problem on the database, since we are storing all the data in small chunks and recovering each chunk can take about 10 seconds, if there is any problem with the database, we can easily restore the whole database in just seconds because we can restore all the small segments in parallel. So basically when you're using Aurora, what's happening is like every time you write something, we are not only replicating the data to the different hard drives, but we are also doing continuous backup. When you choose Aurora, we are taking a backup all the time. So continuously all the time. Each of these block of 10 gigabytes are being uh, continuously uh, backup. So if there is an issue and we have to recover, recovery will happen in parallel for all the different parts of those uh, small chunks of 10 gigabytes. So it will happen in parallel. So no matter how big is your database, we can back up and recover very, very, very quickly because the trick is we are just writing and reading very small files and we are doing that in parallel. That's kind of one of the cool things about Aurora. We are taking full advantage of the parallelization of the cloud, of the scale of the cloud, and for you it's transparent. 
So if there is a, a problem, as I, as I told you, on a traditional database, this is what happened. When you are working with a traditional database, your database, once in a while, is taking what is called a checkpoint, which is basically uh, consolidating on a file on the disk the internal state of the database. And then from the checkpoint, every time you do an operation, the database is keeping a log, a sequence log of all the operations. So if there is a if there is a crash in the middle, the way it works, when the database starts again, first is going to read the checkpointed data, and then it's going to apply incrementally all the changes that you have in the redo log. So eventually, when the database starts, first it takes the checkpoint data, then it applies in sequence all the changes. At this point, the database will start operating and it will start accepting reads and writes. So this is going to take a while. If it happens with Aurora, what happens is the checkpoint chain and the redo log, it works in parallel for each block of 10 gigabytes. So basically, if there is a crash and we need to restart, we are going to read the checkpoint of all the segments in parallel, and then we only have to apply the redo for all the small chunks. So typically, if there is a failure on Aurora, and a hardware failure, and you need to restart the instance, it will take about 50, uh, as much as 30 seconds to be available again, no matter how big is your database. Even if your database is 100 terabytes, in about 30 seconds, it will be up and running again. That's, only, that, that's if you are using uh, only one instance. If you have read replicas, it's going to happen faster. You have read replicas, in, in just a few seconds, the read replica will be accepting writes. But even if you have only one instance, just a few seconds, it will be back to normal. So that's kind of the first thing about Aurora, which is uh, probably very interesting and is different to the way other databases are working. The other cool thing about having this separated storage is that it allows you to create a clone of the database in a very quick way. Since the storage is separated from the instance, we can just say, I want to create a clone of my database you might want to create a clone from a staging for doing testing, or you are working in development and you want to do a clone for trying out something, or you want to do a clone to replicate for an instance for doing reporting, you can create a clone of the database. And it's very quick to create because we don't have to copy any data from the storage. When you are creating a, a clone of the database, we are just creating the instance for the database, and that takes a, about a minute or so, but the storage is shared between the original database and the new clone. So basically, both of them are using the same storage, which means it's very, very, very quick to create a clone of the database. It's also very cheap to do this. And let me just show you a little bit how it works. So this is the original database, the one on the left, where it says the source database. And I've stored data, in the database, in different parts of the database. And then I tell the database, I want to clone it. So when I clone the database, nothing happens. We are not paying for a storage twice because the storage is not, is not replicated. So when you clone the database, a new instance is created and it's pointing to exactly the same uh, space of the storage. If in this database, you change some data, this one's here in uh, gray, the three, five, and six, this represents updates here. So these three, uh, three, five, and six, they have been changed on the clone database. So these three uh, pieces of storage, they will be overwritten for the destination database. But for these three pages, we are still pointing to the original. So basically, we are only changing whenever you do changes in the clone, then we are you are paying for storage. But for this other, you know, for these three parts of the database, you are not paying twice for storage, even if they are two different instances with different permissions, with potentially different configuration for memory and so on, because we are sharing the storage across them. So it gives you a lot of flexibility when you separate the physical storage from actually the instance. Does it make sense so far? Hopefully, yes. I know we are keeping questions for the end, but if you, if, if you are like, you know, if I'm losing you totally, just let me know in the chat so I can go back. So yeah, this, this cool thing about, you know, calling databases is quite powerful because it is very fast and actually, you know, it, it, it works pretty well. And this will be a potential, you know, configuration for Aurora. 
you could have your instance, your master instance, which accepts reads and writes. You could create a read-only replica. As I told you, you can have 15 read-only replicas. And you could also create a clone of the database. So basically, every time you are writing anything to the database, it will be to this storage. The, both the replica and the clone are reading from the same storage. And only if the clone is changing something, then we are, you know, we are adding extra storage only for that clone. But as you know, that's the that's that, that's the beauty of this. That it's we are separating completely storage from CPUs, and we can it enables us to do cool things on reliability, on a fastest recovery, and also on being able to clone a database. And still there are uh, more things that we can do with Aurora, which are hopefully interesting. I'll tell you a bit more about that, but I want to change slightly the topic. Just with me for a second, because in parallel, I'm running here some test, and I'll tell you about that later, but let me just, okay, I'm just sending some, some load to the database so we can see later how it's behaving. Uh, and, and there is one thing that we have to be careful when you are choosing Aurora, because I told you that Aurora supports MySQL and Postgres. And of course, as you know, Postgres and MySQL, they have different uh, capacities. So there are some things that you can do in Aurora for MySQL that you cannot do in Aurora for Postgres, okay? So when you are choosing a database, the things I told you so far, like doing a fast clone of the database or replicating the data automatically, and most of the things about Aurora, they are available both for MySQL and for Postgres. But there are a number of things that are not available for both of them. So if you are choosing Aurora because of some special functionality, just making sure if you know if your target instance, if MySQL or Postgres is supporting that uh, specific part. For example, there is something which I really like, which is database backtracking, which is only supported as of today on Aurora for MySQL. What is the data database backtracking? It means that if I want to go back to any point in time of the database, I can do that with Aurora, with Aurora for MySQL, and I can do that immediately without having to uh, restore in a new instance. If you are familiar with databases, if you, if you are doing point in time recovery, you can do that, and you can do that, of course, with any database, of course, with SQL and with open source. But if you want to go back to a point in time recovery, you need to do it on a new instance. So you need to create a new instance and then apply the point in time recovery over that instance. And that takes a while. Well, the database backtrack, it's a bit more interesting. It allows you to go back on your database without having to create a new one. It allows you to go back and forth. So you can say, hey, I want to go back three seconds, two hours back in time, uh, do a query in this particular point in time. And if I like it, I want to backtrack the whole database to this point. Or you can just, you know, you can just move back and forth. So imagine you have like some problem in your application and it misbehave and you want to correct that, but you are not exactly sure at what point that happened. You can just backtrack a few seconds or a few hours back. You can check the database, the state of the database. If that's not the point, you can move forward, you can move back. And it's very, very quick to do this. And it's like, you know, a, a very powerful way. You can even recover a table you drop or, or something like that without having to restore from a backup. And that's only supported for Aurora for MySQL. So there are some things that are only in one engine or the other, but most of the things, most of the features are actually available in both of them, both for MySQL and for Postgres. Cool. So I've been speaking so far only about, uh, in general, availability, and in general, uh, disaster recovery. So how you can, you know, how we work from a problem, how you can scale replicas, how you can uh, you know, clone a database, but what if you actually want to see about performance? How, because we are replicating data to six different places. This needs to be uh, slower, of course, than just using a database that is writing only to one drive, yeah? It makes sense. I mean, if we are writing to six places, it should be slower, it cannot be faster. I mean, doesn't make any, any sense. But the truth is, it's actually faster. The truth is, uh, if you are using Aurora, you are going to have 
better performance that you see in open source Postgres or open source MySQL. And these numbers are a bit old. I don't have the latest numbers, but uh, this is basically the idea. Uh, running, you know, <clears throat> sorry, running Sysbench, which is a standard industry, uh, you know, benchmark, is actually the one I'm running here behind the scenes right now for my testing, okay? But running Sysbench, which is a bench of different queries for different types. It has queries about writing, some about reading, some about reading without the cache, some about, uh, you know, doing analytical queries. So running the whole Sysbench, the whole number of tests, we found out that we consistently got about five times more throughput than MySQL and three times more throughput than open source Postgres. That's the idea. And it's not only about just reading and writing, it was also about loading data in batches. So batching data, it was also faster both in MySQL than in Postgres. So that was again, interesting. And sometimes more important than that absolute throughput, it's about the uh, variability, which is how consistent we are when we are uh, reading or writing data. If you see here, this chart here, which is a spiking up and down, is the uh, is just a Postgres database on how variable the performance is. And as you can see here, the performance go in spikes. And this is usually because, as I told you before, on a traditional database, you have to do frequent checkpointing. Every time you do a checkpoint, you are consolidating the log to the checkpoint. So in case of a, of a disaster, the database can recover more quickly. And every time there's a checkpoint, basically the whole database slows down. It doesn't stop, but it slows down quite a bit. And that's why you see that you know performance on a typical database, it goes up and down because it has to consolidate once in a while. The line you see here at the bottom, this one, which doesn't look flat, but almost, does the perform the, the consistent performance of Aurora for Postgres. So as you can see here, we have frequent spikes because we are all the time backing up. But you know, in terms of how constant this is, it's quite constant. So it basically means once you decide which size of an instance uh, you are putting there, how many CPUs, how much memory, you are not going to have a lot of surprises. So, you know, it's pretty constant and that's interesting. So we are usually more consistent, 10 times more consistent than open source Postgres and more than 25 times more consistent than open source MySQL. So in terms of performance, that's quite interesting. But, but why are we faster? Why is this this way? And, and there are a number of reasons. And of course, some of them are because we rewrote part of the engines of those databases. Some of the changes we send back to the community because you know open source is cool. Some of the changes were specific to our architecture, so we couldn't open source them because you know they, they didn't make sense. They only make sense inside AWS infrastructure. But the idea is we are just uh, doing less input and output. So we designed the system in a way that we can achieve the same amount of uh, and the same you know the same operations with. Uh, with the same guarantees about you know atomicity and consistency and isolation and durability about doing less input and output and also moving less data fewer data across the network that's kind of the idea we also uh, created some optimizations in the engine for queries and doing prefetching and so on but that's that's what we did and i have a, a, an example of this if you take a traditional mysql this would be the one in the left you have the main database and you have the replicas. I told you on uh, Aurora, you can have up to 15 replicas. So you have the database and you have the replica. And every time you do a change on your database, what happens is the change needs to go to the hard drive. So you are storing into the hard drive a lot of things, as you can see here. You are storing the data itself. This red arrow here is the data. Apart from the data, you need to persist the binary log, which is the, which is the log we are using to recover if there is any kind of problem. A part of that, you are, you are also putting the traditional log of the database. Apart from that, on the particular case of MySQL, 
There is something called the double write, which is the way the engine works, and you have to write the data once again. And also, uh, it has to replicate this data to the instance. So you are not only writing to the to the disk a, a lot of things, you also need to change to the replica instance many things. You need to change the same log, so the instance can replicate all the writes to the database. You also need to change, uh, if, if there is like, you know, if you need to invalidate the cache, it needs to also uh, be invalidated on the instance. So you need to communicate the same data basically to the replica. That's how it works. What we are doing on Amazon Aurora, we are only passing between the master and the replicas a couple of things. We are passing just the lock and we are passing just the information to invalidate the cache. Why? Because everything that happens on the storage, everything about the binary log for recovering from transactions, uh, storing the data, the primary instance, it only grabs once, and then replication happens automatically on the storage layer. But we don't have to communicate all that data to the different instances. So the replicas are going to have more power, more CPU to actually do queries. They don't have to worry about you know, synchronizing absolutely everything because anything to do with the storage is automatically uh, synchronized at the storage layer. So basically replicas only have to worry about the log and the, uh, and the cache. So the only thing they need to know is if I have in memory this data, I need to invalidate it. Other than that, I don't have to do anything. Next time I read from the database, I'm going to be uh, reading the latest version of the data, but they don't have to worry about that. And that's a way in which we make it faster. So basically, as you can see here, we are able to do more transactions and we are doing much fewer input outputs in each transaction. And that is one of the reasons why we are enabling a faster performance on uh, Aurora. And on Aurora, you can do interesting things. For example, sometimes you want to run uh, queries that are very heavy. Imagine you are doing analytics and you don't want to use a traditional data warehouse because it might be a lot of trouble. Maybe you just want to do some reports and you want to run to run the reports on uh, your SQL database because it makes sense. But some of those queries can be actually very heavy, which means your instance is going to be busy. Uh, the CPU of the instance is going to be busy doing aggregations and, and you know waiting for reads and writes and so on. So something you can enable, and it's an option you can enable uh, on your database, and actually you can enable that query by query if you want. You can enable parallel query processing. So parallel query, uh, what it's going to do is like for queries that are analytical, that are doing a lot of aggregations, that are very heavy on the amount of intermediate calculations you have to do. What we are doing with parallel query is that when you are sending the query, instead of being resolved on the instance, it's going to be resolved directly at the storage layer. So basically, if you tell Aurora that you want to do parallel querying, all the fields of the query or all the filters that we can do at the storage layer, the filters are going to happen directly at the storage. So they are not going to be happening in the CPU. They are directly at the storage layer, but not only for the filters, also for aggregations. So in this here, what you see here, is that the executor will be basically the uh, Aurora instance, the aggregator and the network storage driver, all this will be the storage layer. So basically what happens here is we are pushing down to the storage layer, a lot of the computations to do those queries in parallel. So as a result, the storage layer is doing a lot of work, but your instance in the meantime is available to process other things. And only with all, when all the data is already ready on the intermediate layer, then it's, it's, uh, it's sent back to your database. So what that happens with that, what, what happens is like you get very, very, very uh, fast results in some cases because we are doing things in parallel. And also you are getting the same amount of uh, work with a less powerful instance. And when we tried that, we were pretty convinced it was a good idea, but we had Netflix actually as one of the customers testing this out. So Netflix, they reported this. It's like, okay, so for the analytical use cases, this is not for your everyday query. If it's for a regular query, parallel query is going to be slower. 
because parallel query, it needs to divide the query in small chunks and so on. But for queries that are slow, that are analytical, in Netflix, they notice they were getting uh, up to 120 faster results, which is not too bad. In some of the results, in some of the uh, results of, the, of, the, uh, of their bench, they were having more than 10 times the speed up for a lot of queries, not for all of them, but for a lot of queries. And actually, an interesting side effect is that since they were getting uh, better performance with the uh, same database, they were able to go from a database which was four times smaller in terms of CPU. So basically, they were getting faster results. And since the CPU was doing nothing in the meantime, they could go to a smaller instance with, uh, you know, with less CPUs. And that means they were saving money. And parallel querying, it has a different price model. So parallel querying, it makes your queries a bit more expensive. But on the other hand, you can use a CPU which is, uh, you know, which is cheaper. So in the end, it's, uh, it can, you know, it can, uh, it can mean that you are going to be getting a uh, better performance for the same or less money. The best way to try this is just to try it out. I mean, the only th the only thing you have to do is you need to enable parallel querying on Aurora, and once you enable that, Aurora is going to automatically decide if your query is going to be run in parallel or not. That's all you have to do. So if you want to try it out, my advice will be just go and try. If you are not getting any uh, any uh, increase on the performance, just stand off. If for the use case, you see the performance is better, then do your calculations and see what is cheaper to have parallel query and have a less powerful CPU or keep the same CPU and turn off parallel query. But that's kind of the trade-off. You need to, you know, you need to test with your real data to make sure this is interesting for you. If you are running analytical queries, it will be interesting. If you are not running analytical queries, you are, you are going to be spending more money. So just try it out and see how it works. And, and a couple of more things about performance, and then I'll move on to a different thing because I know you want to uh, see other things. But something that you usually don't think about is how the cache works on a traditional database. You know the cache is very important. You take it for granted that the cache is working on a database, and, and databases are great for caching. Databases are super optimized for caching, and if everything goes well, most of your queries are going to be coming from the cache and you're going to be having very, 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 very good performance. But how does it work? In particular, how does it work in Postgres? So this is how it works. When you have a Postgres instance, this, is the, this box represents the memory of the uh, database. So when you have an instance, a part of the memory is just used by Postgres and the operating system processes. That's it, you know, Postgres itself needs some memory. Then another part of the uh, of the instance is going to be the cell buffers, which is truly the cache of the database. And you can configure this. You can configure the cell buffers and a recommendation that Postgres does usually is about 25% 25, 25 of the memory of your database should be for the cell buffers. And of course, this is not a hard rule, but you know, it's a recommendation. The way it works, then you have the Linux page cache, you know already that when you're working with Linux, Linux itself, the file system, is keeping a cache of the uh, of the files that you are opening. So Linux itself is taking you know the cache in memory. So when you are doing a query, what happens is Postgres is going to check first if the data is already in the cache. If it is, then perfect. You know, if it is in the cache, we can return immediately. This is going to be super fast, epic win. What if it's not there? If it's not there, we need to check if it's in the Linux page cache. So it's going to check, is that cache already on the operating system? If it's not there, then it needs to go to the hard drive to retrieve the data. And it's going to be a slow, because reading for a hard drive, when you compare it for reading from memory, it's a slow. Even with a fast hard drive, you know, memory is always faster. So it needs to go to the hard drive. It needs to get the results back. It's going to put the uh, data on the cache, and it's going to send the data back to the uh, to the system. And actually, there is some duplication. Some of the data that is on the page cache is also on the set buffers. 
So this and this is uh, duplicated. So in the end, you are using a lot of memory of this instance for things that is not really directly on the cache. Now take the case of Aurora. In Aurora, we don't have this local hard drive. I told you already, the storage is in a separate layer. And that layer is taking care of everything to do with the storage, including the page cache. So basically in Aurora, all the memory that you are not using for the operating system, you are using for the cache, which means if you compare an instance with the same memory using open source Postgres and the same instance with the same memory running Aurora, you are going to have to uh, about, you know, about two thirds, uh, sorry, two fourths more memory just for your cache. So you're going to be able to have better performance with a smaller machine or, you know, or, or just uh, the same performance with a smaller machine, depending what you are doing. So in this case, when uh, Postgres is asking for the memory, if the data is not in memory, it will be requested to the storage layer, but the storage layer is completely independent. It's not using the memory from the instance. So, you know, you see here, when we design this separating storage from computing, we enable a lot of interesting things. But it's not only about the cache. It's only about what happens when there is a crash on the, uh, on the instance. If there is a crash on the instance here, okay, and we have to start again, you lose the instance, you lose the memory of the, uh, of the cache, because in Postgres, this is tied together. And when you, if, you, if you only lose the Postgres process, the Linux Pascal is still there. But the next time you restart the Postgres process, the buffer has already been removed. So next time you request the data, you need to fill the buffer again until you start getting results. In Aurora, that doesn't happen. Because in Aurora, this buffer runs in a separate process from the main Postgres process, which means if the Postgres process goes down, the buffer is still here. I can we restart automatically the Postgres process in seconds, and the cache is living in memory. We never lost the cache, which, which means your performance is not going to suffer because basically most of the queries are already there. That's kind of the idea, okay? It's not only about the being a suitable cache, it's even more interesting. What happens when you have a failover? When you have a master, um, oh, sorry, a primary, we don't use the, the, the word master anymore, sorry about that. Uh, so what happens if you have a primary and a replica? So if we have a primary and a replica, what happens is uh, the primary is here and it's performing very well because over time, most of the queries are already in the cache. But the, if the master goes down, we are going to promote a new replica. And this failover is very quick. This failover can be in seconds, can be in 30 seconds. Okay, but the new replica, it doesn't have the cache in memory. So what's going to happen with the new replica is that since the data is just in memory, until you catch up and until you actually start performing at the same level that you were performing with the old primary, it's going to take quite a while, okay? In this case, uh, and this is for real, I mean, we, we run this test. So in this test, we are recovering the replica is uh, available in 32 seconds to start setting writes and to be the new, the new primary, but it takes quite a bit to actually catch up with the, uh, with the cache. So something we uh, add last year was the cluster cache management, which means you can tell Aurora, hey, this is my primary database, root and write. And this is one of my replicas. And this is another of my replica. And this replica has the failover priority of zero, which means this replica is going to be the one that will be elected as a primary in case anything happens with the primary. So what we are doing in this case is every time there is a change in the cache of the primary, we are communicating that directly to the replica. So the replica can, it's not only about invalidating the cache, it's also about every time there is a new query that is being stored on the master uh, memory. 
So every time we are adding anything to the cache in the master, we are sending uh, the data. We are sending a, a Bloom filter. We are doing something uh, quite efficient here. But we are communicating to the replica. So the replica is going to be caching the same data, even if we are not reading that data from here, from the storage. So basically, that means the memory of the master of the primary and the memory of the replica, they are going to be pretty much in sync. They might be missing a couple of seconds of replication, but that's the most that you are going to get. As a result, if you enable this, and this is just enabling a parameter on the cluster, this is what happens. Uh, in the new world here, the blue uh, represents the, uh, again, the primary. There is a, the primary goes down. In 30 seconds, we have the replica. And the replica needs to catch up, but it needs to catch up only a few seconds. So basically, it means, you know, in just a few moments, we are up and running at the same with the same performance that we were getting from the primary. In the old case, you can see here, it took a while. So those are kind of the things that we are enabling on Aurora. And that's why I think Aurora, it's, a, it's a better than many other databases. And it has more things. I don't want to, you know, to tell you all the details. There are more things. For example, if you want to do global replication, I told you at the beginning that replication across multiple zones in the same region, it's uh, automatic and including the price. You don't have to do anything about that. But if you want, you can replicate to multiple regions. Imagine you are running your AWS workloads in uh, Frankfurt and Stockholm and Paris, and your primary database, your primary Aurora is maybe in Frankfurt, but you want also to replicate to Stockholm and to Paris because uh, it might be to provide lower latency to customers on those regions. It might be as a, as a mean of having an even higher uh, even failure of resilience in case of a disaster, because some, some industries are very regulated and they need to have by law this, you know, this kind of, of safeguards. So if you want to do global replication, you can do that also directly with uh, Aurora. So if you want to do global replication, you can just configure, this is my primary region. This is one of my secondary regions. This is another secondary region. This is another secondary region. And you only have one master. So data is, you can write only to the primary region, but reads are replicated automatically. And we have typically less than one second of replication across multiple regions. So in just one second, your data is replicated across the world, which is, if you ask me, is quite impressive. Same thing, if the primary region goes down in less than one minute, another region is going to take over. And again, I believe it's quite interesting. And with this, you can support up to 200,000 writes per second and several millions of reads per second with this architecture. So if you want to go multi-region, you can do that. And of course, it's going to be much more expensive because going multi-region means you are going to have the uh, replicas in different parts. And it means you are going to have transfer of the data across regions. As you know, on AWS, transferring data across different regions is more expensive than operating locally. So this is going to be more expensive than running in only one region. But if you need it, it's available. And all you have to do is choose which is the primary, choose your uh, target region for replications, forget about it. It works, and you don't have to do anything else. It's automatic, and it's transparent for you, OK? We are talking about database in the cloud. Of course, uh, backups and snapshots are by default, and they are stored on S3, which is super durable. S3 gives you 11 nines of durability. It means that it's more likely that an asteroid is falling on Earth that actually that you are losing data because of a hardware failure on S3. So you know you are getting good, uh, very good uh, durability, and it's you know it's automatic. If you want, you can also take manual backups, and that also works. So you can do that without any issues. The automatic backups they have a difficult retention, but if you do backups by hand, you can store them as much as you want. So you have full full uh, control how you work with this. You also have full control of working with, uh, of listening for changes on the data. So you can enable what we call activity streams. 
And every time there is a change on your database, every time there is a, a, new, a new record or a deletion, but also every time you create a new user. So anytime there is absolutely any change, even if you want, you can monitor even select activities. So every time there is any activity on the database, you can enable the activity streams, which was going to happen is going to send all the activities through Amazon Kinesis, which is a service we have for real time. Um, from Kinesis, you can do whatever you want with the data. So we are enabling this for industries where you need to have uh, an audit uh, and traceability of everything happening on your database. If you need that, you can actually enable activity streams. If, some, if all you want to do is just uh, run in store procedures using lambdas, you can do that without activity system. So you can actually uh, write a serverless store procedure using lambda, and every time there is a change on the database, you can fire a trigger, and the trigger can be a lambda function. But if you want to have all the activities from the database, uh, you can do that uh, just enabling the activity streams, and they are automatically uh, enabled. You don't have to do anything else. And um, one of the things I really like, and I'm going to do a demo of this, is that I told you from the beginning, uh, one master, 15 replicas, blah, 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 blah. And that's cool, but that's kind of, uh, don't get me wrong, boring. Because if you've been around AWS, and at the beginning during the introduction today, when we were waiting for the talk to start, some of you were speaking about serverless. So if you are doing serverless computation, you probably are used to tools like uh, DynamoDB, which allows you to truly, uh, it's a truly serverless database. A truly serverless database means that without having to worry about any servers, the more, uh, the more activity you are sending to the database, the database grows automatically and you only pay for that. You pay only for the activity you have on the database. You don't need to think in advance if I need one replica or three or 15, if I want to have, you know, uh, if, if my users are coming uh, on Monday morning and then leaving on Monday evening and then again on Wednesday, how I do this? How can I scale those things? It, it's not easy to do those things. And don't get me wrong, with traditional Aurora, you, you can enable auto scaling. You can tell Aurora, I want to auto scale. And you can tell Aurora, I want to go from one replica to three or to four or to 15. And it's going to automatically monitor the activity and it will add and remove replicas automatically without you, without you having to do anything. You only have to configure the auto scaling. But adding a new replica or removing a new replica is going to take minutes. Okay? So it's not ideal. That's kind of the thing. So you can enable auto scaling in Aurora and it works. We have, we have something better. We have something called Aurora Serverless. And Aurora Serverless, uh, we have the version one, which is the one you still get if you go to AWS. But we announced recently, we announced in December, Aurora Serverless version two. And I already have access to the preview of version two. So version two is not available for everyone. Uh, it's only available right now in, in one region in the US. It will be uh, in the next few months, it will be available for everyone. If you want to uh, to use Aurora Serverless version two, because you know, because you really have the use case, you can actually request that. You can actually go to uh, to the page of Aurora Serverless, and you can request to be part of the preview. I' not sure if I can show you here because I'm already logged in. Uh, I cannot show you the, the, the button for the preview. I actually can do that. I can just open an incognito window. Amazon Aurora serverless version two. So let me just, yeah, yeah, Google, I know you are spying on me. That's okay. So, uh, here. So you can go to the announcements of Aurora serverless. And you can actually fill in this form. And you tell us which is your AWS account. You tell us what your base, blah, 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 and how you're using AWS. And hopefully, you'll get invited to the preview. I was invited to the preview exactly 15, 
I, I think it wasn't even 15 days ago. So it's been less than two weeks since I have access to Rural Serverless version two. And I want to show you today how it works because I think it's super cool. So uh, from the beginning of today, from the beginning, uh, actually during the afternoon and during this talk, I've been sending workloads to three different versions of Aurora. Here at the bottom, this one you see here, this is traditional Aurora. This is just the Aurora I've been telling you about the whole day. It's an instance, it's just a, a, a master, and I've been sending some data. And the last run I've been doing, I've been sending about 2,000 events per second, which is not too much. It, it's only writes. I'm not doing here reads. I'm just writing data. So I've been writing about 2,000 events per second. And I've been doing that for five minutes. So in total, I've been sending about 600,000 in this particular test. I Here are the results. So basically, the uh, percent for the 95 percentile, I was getting 360 uh, seconds of latency, which is not too bad. And that was with traditional, uh, you know, I actually am going to start another test again now. And this was with traditional Aurora. This is with Aurora Serverless version one, the one I have here. And with Aurora Serverless version one, I was uh, sending events. It was performing better. It was not within 2000 per second. In this case, I actually scaled quite a bit. So it was actually within, in this particular uh, test, it was writing uh, almost 9,000 events per second. So in the end, in five minutes, I was sending more than two million and a half of events, writing events. And the 95 percentile was 90 uh, seconds. And I'm going to run this test again while I'm showing you things. And this is Aurora serverless version two. It was also about 8,000 uh, events per second. And the percentile was the lowest of all of them, which is interesting. But apart from this, I want to show you actually the monitoring, which I think is super cool. So here I have a CloudWatch uh, monitoring with, with my Aurora. And I'm going to show you this chart. Oops, I want to edit this. So let me show you what this means. First things first, as I said, I just got access to this literally a few days ago. So you can see here on this chart when I got access to the preview. <laughs> so yeah, you can see here, it was on the 17th of February. So this was the first day I got access. So I was trying it. And you can see here, I've been doing a few demos these days. <laughs> so in the past hours today, I've been doing actually a few things. And I want to show you how this works. So let me just first remove everything. And this is uh, the CPU utilization of my Aurora serverless version one. So I was starting one test. It was for five minutes. Then I will stop. I will start again. I will stop. Here I was starting again. And here it was starting again, stopping, starting again. Now I just start another one. So this is kind of the, you know, the CPU utilization. For serverless version two, I was doing pretty much the same. So I was running the test almost in parallel. So the utilization of the CPU, you can see is pretty much the same. I'm using the machines, then I stop, I start, I stop, I start, I stop. But now let's see how Aurora serverless was adapting. So serverless version one, the one you have right now on production, it was working like this, it's the green line, okay? So I was stacking the CPU and it was slowly catching up. And when I say slowly, it is slowly. It, it took a while to actually, you know, so you see the shape of the CPU. So at this point, it was already up to capacity, you know, to what I needed. But at this point, actually, I had to stop sending a request and Aurora, was still scaling up. So at this point, I stopped sending requests. And Aurora was at the maximum for a while. And then it decided, oh, I don't have any requests anymore. I'm going to start scaling down. And then when I started sending requests, as you see here, it took a while to catch up. 
So it's serverless. You don't have to worry about that. You only pay for the capacity, but it's lagging a bit behind. Now, let's see the difference with Aurora serverless version two. So this blue line is, I want to remove the V1, so it's easier to follow. So this is the CPU for Aurora serverless version two and how it's adapting immediately. I have more CPU, I'm getting more capacity for the database. When I stop, database is not growing anymore. When I stop sending data, database almost immediately stops. So that means I'm not paying extra. I'm just paying for exactly what I need. When I get data in seconds, I get extra capacity. When I don't need data, it stops. I'm not paying for that because what's the point? So in the past, we were already offering serverless, but we're not able to react so quickly. We were a bit more conservative. We changed that, we invested in making that better. It's not only about uh, being able to scale, it's also about the latency. So let me just show you this one, this set of latency. The provision Aurora is the Aurora, you know, the traditional Aurora I, I will, uh, come on chart. So this is the traditional Aurora, the blue one, the provision Aurora latency. The serverless version one is the spiky line and the serverless version two is the green line. So as you can see here, the version one of serverless is always, it has a bit more latency than the other ones until it catches up. Basically serverless version two, it has very low latency. At some points, it's slightly worse than provision it, but there is a trick here. I, it's accepting more writes. So latency is a bit bigger, but at the same time, it's doing much more writes. I told you in uh, traditional Aurora, we are doing about 2000 with this machine, about 2000 writes per second, but in serverless version two, I'm doing about 8,000. So I'm accepting four times the throughput with only a slightly more latency, four, four, four times the throughput. And the throughput is here. You can see here, the blue line is the traditional Aurora and the green line is the serverless. Okay, so I'm, I'm accepting much more capacity, much more writes actually with, so I'm adapting better. My customers will be able to access the page, latency will be under control, and I don't have to worry about any databases. It just goes up and down when you need it. And the version two of Aurora Serverless, it has parity in the uh, features with traditional Aurora. If you were using Aurora Serverless version one, there were a lot of trade-offs. In version one, you couldn't do fast clones. In version one, you couldn't use Lambda. In version one, you couldn't do parallel queries. In version one, you couldn't do many things. In version two, Aurora Serverless version two, exactly the same you get in traditional Aurora, just serverless. So depending on your use case, if your use case is a uh, very constant workloads, traditional Aurora is perfect. If your use case is like a spiky data, serverless is perfect. So it really depends what you want to do. You want to use one or the other. That's kind of the uh, idea. And just to finish, because I know we are already approaching the time. This is a chart so when you know how it scales, but I saw you a bit better. So I just wanted to tell you one more thing about Aurora, which is super cool. You can actually run machine learning directly from SQL. So if you have trained a machine learning model on Amazon SageMaker, our, our uh, machine learning solution, you can directly from SQL, you can run a query, which is going to pass parameters to the model and give you the, the, the prediction. And if you want to use that for things like sentiment analysis, it's supported out of the box. You don't have to train any models. But if you are running a machine learning in your company and you want to run the queries to the machine learning model directly from SQL, with Aurora, you can connect that, both with MySQL and with Postgres. Uh, if you want to learn about the internals of Aurora, you have a lot of information here on that blog post. I, I can actually copy and paste that if I can. Let me ask for a second, copy and paste that. So if you want to learn about the internals of Aurora, that's a blog post we uh, wrote when we launched the service. And there is a lot of in interesting information about quarrels and replication and how the magic works behind the scene. But yeah, that, that's pretty much it. I, I hope you saw why I'm very excited about Aurora and why I think it's better than many databases that are super cool, don't get me wrong, but they are not designed for the cloud. So we believe this is the 
proper first fully uh, compatible SQL database that takes full advantage of a cloud environment. And with that, I'm pretty much done here, Anas. Thank you. <laughs> so any questions, I'm happy to take them.